Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this workers' retreat. We thank you because you have spoken to our hearts in the various programs and the various things we've done within the retreat. And we pray that what you have done and what you have given us will never fade away in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because you reminded us of things that maybe we knew them before but we are forgetting them. You have refreshed us. You have blessed us. And you have done things that are very definite in our hearts and our lives. And we pray that the benefit of these experiences will remain with us in Jesus' name. Amen. As we round up now, we pray that you'll be with us and assist us in everything. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Seated. Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We've been here since yesterday, receiving from the Lord and reminding ourselves of the grace, the strength, the might, the power available with the Lord for us to serve more than before. Now we consider the weights that can hinder us from getting the victory, from being successful, from being intimate and close in fellowship with the Lord, and from attaining to the promises of the Lord. We have been given a lot of examples in Hebrews chapter 11 of the people who pressed on until they achieved what the Lord purposed for them in their lives. The things that are related there concern not just what we call the ministry, but it concerns literally everything. It talks about the personal lives of some of the people, the family lives of some of them, and gives us examples of men and women talks about assignments they were given to do, talked about the ministries that were committed into their hands, and talked about the various things that today we struggle with. And then he tells us, you've seen all these examples. Let's think about them, but then beyond the examples that you have got, so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us look at a singular example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who had something before him. And he set his faith as a, as a flint, so that he'll be able to achieve what the Father sent him to achieve. There were difficulties on his way, hindrances on his way, that could have stopped any man from achieving the purpose and the perfect plan of God. And yet, we're told that right now, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He has overcome. He has achieved. He has finished the race. That if we look to him, the same grace that was available for him is available for us. And God's love is also available for us. But then he mentions something in verse 1. He says, let us lay aside every weight. 
and the sin which does so easily beset us. Only as we do that shall we be able to run the race with patience that is set before us. So we are considering the weights that hinder. What are the weights that could drag us down, that could pull us back, impede the progress of the journey, make us become stagnant, or make us not to be able to move forward in the race that God has set before us. As you look at people in the Bible days, you will see people that all that you have recorded about them in the Bible is that they were born, they lived, they died. Nothing more about their lives. And yet we know that when God creates, he does so for a, for a reason, for a purpose. Why then do we read about people that lived, some of them even hundreds of years, in the early part of the Bible? And the only record is that they lived, then they died. No significant thing that they achieved. In our human language, we'll say, they passed through the world like birds of the air passing through the sky without leaving any mark behind them. Or we'll say, they crawled through life like insects. The little mark they made had been rubbed up by the legs, by the feet of the pedestrians. They didn't do anything major. And it says, if we are not careful, if we allow these ways to drag us down, impede our progress in the journey, we'll just be like that. That you will look back, and eventually you would say, what have I achieved? What have I got? And you know, your happiness in eternity will depend on what mark you are making now while you are passing through this place. And you know that we pass through this life just once. Every day that we live, we'll pass through that day just once. Like yesterday came, now it's gone. Look at this year. It's now running to a close. When we began this year, we thought it was very long. And we had a lot of plans, a lot of projects, personal, family, ministerial, whatever. And we said, well, 12 months before me, 52 weeks before me, before those 365 days run out, 366 days run out, I would be able to get this, this, and that. And yet, without knowing, there were weights dragging us down. That now, as the year is running to a close, we say, well, this one is gone. But... I'll plan for the coming year. And you see, that is how many people run through life, and they never make any mark. We must begin to ask ourselves, in the lives that we have lived up till this present time, what mark have we made? And we must begin to ask ourselves that by the time that we eventually leave this place, if you look at the program on your hand, where it says only remembered, that song, the second stanza says, Shall we be missed, though by others succeeded? That means after we have left, would they, will we leave a vacancy? Would we have done something so important, so strategic, that makes a mark, that after we have left, they would say, how can we find a man like that again? You see, these people we have read about, a great cloud of witnesses. Abel, he left a place, though dead, yet speaking. Enoch, he left a lesson behind. Though he had been dead, his faith is still alive. And he throws a challenge to people today. Noah, in his own generation, will read about him and will say, if I can just be like that man, so surrendered and obedient to the Lord, that man left a mark before he left. And yet, there were people 
in their own days. There were people at their own time. Methuselah lived long. Don't you wonder how a man can live so much like that? So many years like that? And what had, what had he left behind? What do we remember about him? Long life, but useless life. No record, nothing. Shall we be missed, though by others succeeded, reaping the fields we in springtime have sown? What that means is that if at this sowing time you sow a lot, a lot of acres, and then during the time of the harvest, maybe you're gone for your reward, maybe you are not around, those who are harvesting the field, they would know we didn't sow here. This is the work of so-and-so. This is the labor of so-and-so. Because now they are reaping what you sowed. Yes, but the sowers must pass from their labors. Ever remembered by what they have done. Now, as you are sitting here today, if I asked you, do you remember your teachers in the primary school? Some of them, you can't even remember their names. And yet you are with them for one whole year before you passed on to the other class. What did he teach? How did he live? What was unique about him? What was different about him? You can't remember now. Even secondary school that is still close by you. If I ask you, how about the teachers that taught you and will begin to remember this year, this year, this year? You remember them faintly. And you try to recollect their names. You say, well, I am poor at remembering names. No, it's not that you are poor at remembering names. It is that they didn't contribute anything significant. That's why you don't remember them. Because if I asked you, in your early years, when you are very, very young, who is the person that comes to your mind very readily? Oh, you say so and so. What did he do to you? Well, not much. We just played together. I was very, very familiar. And I remember when I was very, very young, that that uh, little fellow like myself, they were, she was even more important than the people that were close by. That person contributed something. And you never can forget. And when you remember, when you uh, just recollect the name of the person, you say, oh, I wish I could see that person now. They contributed something. Look at us since we became Christians. You've seen many, many believers. We have many of them in our church. You've come across a lot of people. And yet, there are just about two or three that you say, I will never forget. That brother, I'll never forget him. That sister, I'll never forget. I don't think I'll be where I am now if it were not for that person, for that person. They contributed something. And so are other people thinking about you. Now I must ask you, in the large zone that you belong to, in this big district you belong to, who would remember you after they are transferred out of town? And they would always be saying, so and so, I can never forget her prayers. I can never forget her encouragement. I can never forget her comforting words. I can never forget the support. I can never forget the prayers and the cares. You see, that's very important. And so, many of these people we have read about, we can never forget them. They made something so important in history. In the history of the people of God. And we're surrounded by these clouds of witnesses. But then the Lord is telling us, if you two will make an impact like that, lay aside every wage. Lay aside every wage. Immediately I read that, I begin to remember people in the Bible whose lives could have been very, very major, very, very major, if it were not that they didn't lay aside every wage. I think about Saul in the Old Testament. What a man. When he came out before the people as he was to be chosen to be a king, the people shouted, they'd never see anybody like that in Israel. Great, powerful, with, a, with an imposing personality and figure, they said, this is the fellow we're looking for. Unanimously, they said, we don't need any votes. This is our man. 
but he didn't lay aside every word. I think about Solomon. He had a great future before him. A great future before him. God wanted him to be greater than his father David. And he said, you will not build a house for me, David, but your son, Solomon, he will build a house for me. That man, if you will follow me as you have followed me, the nations will never forget him. And at the beginning of his reigning, very, very young, the Lord came to him and said, what do you want? He said, I need wisdom. The Lord said, that's very good. I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give you a good kingdom. Then I will give you riches and wealth. That man had a great future before him. Kings were coming from different, different parts of the world. And you remember the queen of Sheba. Every hard question, Solomon answered. And the woman said, when I came, now I believe everything. I didn't believe everything before. But half was not told to me. But you remember Solomon. He didn't lay aside every weight. You must remember a man called Samson. He had a great future before him. Before he was born, an angel came to the parents and said, You are going to have a son. He will be mighty. He will deal with the enemy single-handedly. Nobody will be able to forget how he will deal with enemies. And the spirit of the Lord began to move him in the camp between Dan and Bethel. And as he took the jawbone of an ass, he destroyed the enemy. He would lift up the poles or the posts of their gates until they were saying, nobody can catch this man. A future stretched out before him, but he did not lay aside every weight. He also fell by the wayside. You come to the New Testament and to be a companion of Paul the Apostle, what a great privilege. And here was a man called Demas. He was in the team, traveling around with this man that had revelations that he couldn't try to all revelations now. He said, I knew some revelations, that's Paul the Apostle, that it would be unlawful for me to tell you. And Demas had such an opportunity. But again, he did not lay all the weights aside beside him. And I haven't seen all these examples. Here is now your own time. What is it that will hinder you? For Solomon, it was the passing enjoyment and the indulgence of the flesh. For Samson, it was an unnecessary indulgence of the flesh. For Saul, it was the preservation of some sheep that the Lord had wanted him to destroy, and Agag as well. And for Demas, it was this present world that he loved. And yet, all these things will not bring eternal satisfaction. You begin to think about yourself. All over the years, what, have, what are the things that have made you to stumble? That you said, I lost that opportunity. Why? I lost that privilege. What were the weights you didn't lay aside? Now the Lord is saying, you still have a new chance. You're still young. There are great possibilities now in your life. We've talked about the people that already they have died. And there is no going back. They cannot come back now and make right what was wrong. But here you are today. Here we are today. Still, the privilege is yours. The promise is unto you. And still to our children, as many as the Lord our God shall call. We can still make a success of the ministry. But what are the weights we need to lay aside? It says, let us lay aside every weight. Every weight. You know, there are people that would say, well, I've tried. I've laid aside some of the weights. But now the things that are hindering me and disturbing me are just this, this, and that. You won't be able to run the race if you still have some of those weights. Lay aside every weight. And the sin which does so easily beset us. When you're running a race, you need to be free. Completely free. 
When you were at school, didn't you run? Didn't you take part in athletics? Didn't you see how you were scantily dressed for the athletics? Because you couldn't carry a lot of things with you. A lot of things at your back. A lot of things on your hand. And a heavy boat. And then say that you want to run in a race. But what our teachers did not tell us when we were at school is that it is not just the weight you have externally. It is the weight that you have internally that makes you not to be able to run the race. Think about somebody wanting to run a race in athletics and is thinking that my girlfriend disappointed me. What did I do to her? How could she jolt me, just uh, you know, revolt like that and rebel like that? I'm angry. I'm unhappy. The next time when I finish running this race, and the next time I see her, I'm going to fight her very seriously, he'll never be able to run. Think about something wanting to have high jump those days. And then while the people are waiting, just watching this man jump over that bar, he cites somebody at the uh, spectator seat and he says, ah, so this fellow came to the spectator seat and um, he abused my mother, abused my father. Just one week ago, I will never forget. And while he's thinking about that uh, person, you know, looking at the people that are jumping, he'll say, in fact, I, I, I'm still going to revenge. I'm still going to revenge. That man cannot get away with that thing. When I finish this uh, jumping and I get my prize and I get the medal, I'm going to deal with that man. The weight, internal weight, will not allow the man to jump. That bitterness is heavier than the boat that she has gotten rid of. You think about somebody. In those days, uh, we used to throw the javelin in athletics, in the sports. And uh, he wants to throw the javelin. Oh, and then he said, uh, well, the only thing is that I do not want to compete with so-and-so, with so-and-so. We can never go together. Because uh, we don't see, we are competitors, and I don't like him. I don't like him. Anywhere he is, I can't be my best. He'll never be able to throw what he wants to throw. That's what the Lord is telling us, that it is the internal weight that drags us down more than the external weight. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 24, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, controlled, in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself shall be a cast away. I bring my body under. Young men and young women, who have not got married, a lot lies before you, a lot that you can do for the Lord. But remember, if you do not keep the desires of your body under, that alone can make you fail in the work that God has set before you. But Paul the Apostle said, I bring my body under, I put it under control. I do not allow anything to control me. Haven't you found people that they were born again? They have a lot of talents. And in the Christian work, they could have done a lot. The new music, the new about writing, they have some administration, they have leadership qualities, a lot of things they add in their lives. And as they came to the church, you saw their zeal, you saw their ability. Oh, you said, this person will make a fine leader. God has already given him some talents and gifts that will be useful in the work of the Lord. But 
before he came to the Lord, he was drinking. Now he's been born again. And at present, he's, he had not been drinking. But he started to allow this party, this ceremony, this little thing, this little thing, until the temptation came. And he started drinking. And even though he had all these qualities and all these talents, because he went back into drinking and he backslid, he couldn't do anything for the Lord. And anytime you are doing some work in the house of the Lord, you remember...